Ruth Werner's best-selling book, A Massage Therapist's Guide to Pathology, is a highly regarded, comprehensive resource that sets the standard for pathology education. Written for massage therapy students and practitioners, this groundbreaking resource serves up a comprehensive review of the pathophysiology, signs, symptoms, and treatment of more than 500 diseases and disorders. Learn more at booksofdiscovery.com. Anatomy Trains is delighted to announce a brand new dissection live stream specialty class on September 18th, Lumbo-Pelvic Stability a one-day layered dissection with Anatomy Train's author, Tom Myers, and master dissector, Todd Garcia. The early bird price of $150 is held until September 10th. After September 10th, the price is $250. Come see the body's actual core for yourself. This course will be provided over Zoom webinar with multiple camera views, live chat, and Q&A. Visit anatomytrains.com to sign up. Hi, and welcome to I Have a Client Who, Pathology Conversations with Ruth Werner, the podcast where I will discuss your real-life stories about clients with conditions that are perplexing or confusing. I'm Ruth Werner, author of A Massage Therapist's Guide to Pathology, and I have spent decades studying, writing about, and teaching about where massage therapy intersects with diseases and conditions that might limit our client's health. We almost always have something good to offer, even with our most challenged clients, but we need to figure out a way to do that safely, effectively, and within our scope of practice. And sometimes, as we have all learned, that is harder than it looks. Today's episode comes from a massage therapist in Massachusetts who shares this tender story. I have a very compromised client. She has a pacemaker, she's diabetic, she has congestive heart failure and lymphedema in her legs. And she had a mild case, those are her words, of COVID last December. Her only symptom was tightness in her chest. I saw her a few times for light upper body massage only after I reopened this summer. In September, I got a call from her saying she'd gone to the ER and been hospitalized over the weekend with IV blood thinners because she was so short of breath, and she couldn't walk from room to room in her house without sitting down to take a break. X-rays showed multiple blood clots in her lungs and a condition called ground glass syndrome. Upon discharge from the hospital at the end of the weekend, she was put on an oral blood thinner and I've not seen her for massage since this happened. Other than very light touch massage, do you have any recommendations or precautions for treatment whenever she might call for an appointment? I'm thinking Reiki. Right. So here's a client with a complex medical history who contracted what she experienced at first as a mild case of COVID-19, But then she went on to develop a couple of really serious complications on top of her already very serious other health challenges. Just in the interest of full disclosure, I am recording this in early December of 2021, and long COVID is very much on my mind. I wrote a feature article on this topic for the January-February 2022 edition of Massage and Bodywork, In that article, there's a pretty good list of screening questions for clients who have recovered from COVID and may be having symptoms of long COVID, so I will refer you to that. On the day that I am recording this, the Omicron variant of COVID has been identified in the United States in several locations. By the time this episode goes live, it will probably be everywhere. And over the next year or maybe more, I expect we will be seeing a lot of clients like this lady who contracted COVID and then later finds that she has extensive damage that might be permanent. So although we could use this story to talk about diabetes or pacemakers or heart failure or lymphedema, I think the primary issue at this moment is long COVID. And in the 10 to 15 minutes that I use for these podcasts, I won't be able to do a deep dive, but I can at least skim the surface of a couple of things that we'll probably see a lot of in the coming months or maybe years. Those couple of things for this client are blood clots and scarring in the lungs. 
Let's do the ground glass syndrome issue first. The scarring that is caused by infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a particular presentation, and these lesions are called ground glass opacities. I will post some pictures of images in our show notes for today. They're called ground glass opacities because they resemble a stage in glass making where the glass is blasted by sand and becomes gray and hazy instead of translucent. Ground glass opacities indicate areas where the lung tissue is denser and less functional than it should be, and that density can be related to scarring, collections of pus, thickened alveolar walls, or other problems. There are several types of ground glass opacities. They can look like nodules or halos. There's even a type that is specific to COVID-19 called crazy paving ground glass opacities. Ground glass opacities are not unique to covid Other types of lung problems can cause them from time to time as well, but the vast majority of people with diagnosed COVID-related pneumonia, one source said up to 83% of them, show these special ground glass opacities on their CT scans or their x-rays. Mild ground glass opacities with just some haziness can spontaneously resolve after infection, but if they are advanced, that scar tissue may be permanent. And the thing about scarring in the lungs is that this can have big repercussions for both the respiratory system and for the rest of the body. The act of healthy respiration takes an astonishingly small amount of our total energy expenditure, only about 5% of our resting energy. But when that activity becomes more laborious, then everything else we do gets much harder too, including eating and sleeping and, of course, any kind of movement. This is essentially the process that people go through when they have chronic bronchitis and emphysema, all that is under that umbrella of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it is a very, very challenging situation. Another phenomenon that we've seen with some COVID survivors is a situation where the process of making scar tissue in the lungs can become self-sustaining. In other words, even though the infection may have passed, for reasons we don't understand, the lungs continue to become progressively denser and denser and less functional. And this situation is called pulmonary fibrosis, and it is potentially terminal. I believe there is a role for massage therapy to play for people who are struggling with breathing problems and shortness of breath, and I'll come back to that in a bit. The other thing I want to pay just a bit of attention to for this client is her experience of blood clotting and COVID-related coagulopathy. Oh, this is a complicated topic. Early in the pandemic, it seems years ago, doesn't it? There was some widespread and absolutely justified concern about COVID risks and blood clotting and massage therapy. We were hearing all these stories of young and otherwise healthy people dying of heart attacks and stroke and pulmonary embolism. I still remember hearing an interview with a brain surgeon who described watching blood clots form in real time as he was performing surgery. We didn't have a great grasp on what was happening. Frankly, we're still working on it. A lot of the COVID-related coagulopathy mechanisms are far beyond my feeble level of understanding having to do with acute phase reactants and IL-6 induction of tissue factor that precipitates the formation of thrombin and stuff like that. But a couple of the concepts are graspable. One is that inflammation promotes blood clotting. This is well established. It's part of the process that we see with sepsis and other inflammatory conditions. Also, SARS-CoV-2 can invade endothelial cells that line our cardiovascular system. And disruptions here promote blood clots too. And hypoxia, low oxygen levels, because remember those lungs are now obstructed with scar tissue. Hypoxia causes us to produce more red blood cells and that thickens blood too. And these factors, plus all those chemical cascades that are influenced by the inflammation and cytokine storms we've seen with acute COVID infections, all of this contributes to COVID-related coagulopathy. I wrote an article on this topic early in the pandemic, and although we've learned more by now, the basic principles still hold. So if you're interested, I'll make that available to you in the show notes. I also wrote an article on pulmonary fibrosis and its connection to COVID-19, so you'll find that there as well. 
Right. So now we have this massage therapy client who before COVID had congestive heart failure and a pacemaker and diabetes and lymphedema in her legs and who was probably on a complicated regimen of medications to manage all those conditions. And then she got COVID and she came through with what she called a mild case. And that's awesome. But then months later, she got sick again. Is this a resurgence of her first infection? Is it maybe a second infection altogether? Regardless, this time she did not have a mild case. Our contributor told us this. In September, I got a call from her saying she'd been to the ER and hospitalized over the weekend with IV blood thinners because she was so short of breath she couldn't walk from room to room in her house without sitting down to take a break. X-rays showed multiple blood clots in her lungs and a condition called ground glass syndrome. On discharge from the hospital at the end of the weekend, she was put on an oral blood thinner and I've not seen her for massage since this happened. Well, whatever happened, this lady got by with only a weekend in the hospital, so by all accounts, she's still pretty lucky. In the process, she learned that now she has some lung scarring, along with multiple blood clots in her lungs, those are pulmonary emboli, of course, and her prescription of anticoagulants won't melt those clots, they would, that would require thrombolytics. But anticoagulants, those blood thinners, will help to slow or prevent the formation of new clots. What can massage do for her? Well, with respect for her very complicated situation, there's a lot we can think about. What questions do you have for and about this lady? This is a great time to exercise our critical thinking muscles as we try to identify the relevant variables that have to go into this clinical decision-making process. Firstly, we need to know what this client would like to have happen with massage. If sleeping well and deeply is her priority, that gives us some ideas about how to structure a session. If being able to take a deep breath is her goal, well, that might send us down a different pathway. Maybe she has a lot of muscle aches and pains from being bedridden for some days and she'd like some help with that. We really can't start to form any strategies until we know what she wants from our work. Of course, the coagulopathy issue is a big concern. And we want to know what her status is with that. We want to know what kinds of signs and symptoms related to blood clotting she still has. How is it for her to take a deep breath? Does she have chest pain when she does anything taxing like climbing stairs? Remember, she couldn't even walk across her room when all this started. We're told she's on blood thinners now. I'd like to know if she's encouraged to be active or if she's being counseled to avoid activity because that would give us some ideas about the safety of massage therapy too. And of course, we want to know about any side effects related to her medication, especially around easy bruising. So far, all the signs are pointing toward just offering the lightest kind of comfort-related touch, a presence that will be supportive and maybe energizing, but without taxing this client's capacity for adaptation. Our contributor wonders about Reiki. And this is a topic on which I am definitely not an expert, but it's hard to see what risks it would involve. So if the client is enthusiastic, well, that seems like a good starting place. But before we leave this at just do super light work that doesn't disrupt this client's compromised system, I'd like to advocate for some gentle breath work that doesn't run the risk of overpowering her system. The research shows that massage is pretty good at helping people feel better about breathing. Guided breathing into specific areas of the thorax can help to distribute oxygen and increase awareness, may help to decrease a sense of restriction or limitation in breathing, and that's a sensation that can exacerbate lots of other negative experiences like pain and anxiety and fear related to her infection. Again, this all has to be guided by the client's priorities and the therapist's skills. I expect to have more questions about clients with the after effects of COVID infections, I already have a couple more in the queue for I Have a Client Who episodes. So the sooner we become knowledgeable about the situation, the better a position we'll be in to offer safe and effective help. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to I Have a Client Who Pathology Conversations with Ruth Warner. Remember, you can send me your I Have a Client Who stories to I Have a Client Who at abmp.com. 
That's I have a client who, all one word, all lowercase, at abmp.com. I can't wait to see what you send me, and I'll see you next time.